Good morning. Knock, knock. Holy. It's Holy Humor Sunday at St. Andrews. Well, good morning and welcome to Holy Humor Sunday at St. Andrews Night Church in North Bay. We are so glad that you're here to celebrate God's great surprise in the resurrection of God's beloved child, Jesus Christ. And if you are joining us later on, today online, we hope that this time of worship will be a blessing to you. Knock, knock. Well, I can tell you there's two people not here today. One is Ralph, who is feeling under the weather, and the other is Liz Brownlee, who was supposed to be the liturgist today, um, and she sent me an email yesterday morning saying, could you please fill in for me, because I'm not feeling well. So we're missing those two, and we'll hold them in our prayers. Apparently, God has chosen to surprise us with an unusual warm sunny day this afternoon, at least that's what the weather reports says. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that it is sunny this afternoon. At St. Andrews United Church, we are a safe and inclusive and nurturing community where all people are welcome, not only to enter the doors, but also to take part in every part of our church life. I'd like to draw your attention this morning to the Together Sheet prepared by Janet Ross and made available on the website by our own Derek Stott. In it you will find lots of great information and online and, and an on outline of worship plans for the season of Easter. On a sad note this morning, we heard with sorrow this week that Marjorie Gardner, mother of Carolyn Wright, passed into spirit on Good Friday. For a time, Marjorie was a resident at Empire Living, and Carolyn would bring her to join us for worship. You will remember her as a lovely and gracious woman, and more recently, she had become a resident, I think, at East Home. We hold Carolyn and her family in our hearts. May this light be a symbol for us of God's light and returning joy in dark times. For hundreds of years, the land on which we are so privileged to worship has been inhabited by the people of Nipissing First Nation. And as a congregation, we express our gratitude for their faithful stewardship of these lands and pledge to continue working towards true reconciliation and right relations with our Indigenous sisters and brothers. We light this candle to represent the presence of the Creator Spirit with us as we strive to work into community. Let us join together in our call to worship. Joy is loose and laughter abounds in the giggles of children and the chuckles of adults. We praise God for this glorious day. Let mirthful praise break forth in the most unlikely places and in silly ways. Joy and elation fill our hearts and our songs. Let the laughter and praise be deep, for we are God's people. Our opening hymn this morning is from Voices United 820, Make a joyful noise.
I should have mentioned that the musical accompaniment was recorded by Ralph. So the choir just heard the music this morning and they're trying to sing along with the recording. So you'll have to bear with us. Let's join together in our gathering prayer in the Lord's Prayer. In your bulletin, you will see that it says the Lord's Prayer Caribbean version. We are not going to do the Caribbean version because we do not have a recording of the Caribbean version music. So we will be doing the Lord's Prayer from Voices United 959. Let us pray. Loving God who turns sorrow to joy, darkness to light, floods into rainbows, and water into wine, accept the praise we bring to you this day in the lightheartedness does not diminish its sincerity, for we know that your child laughed and his companions and revealed in the joy of your spirit. Make our laughter our worship and our joy our gift to you. This we pray in the name of the risen Christ, your joke on the tempter. Amen. hears our words and laughter, and laughs with us. Thanks be to God. I'm going to apologize right now to Liz, who is going to be watching this later today. She asked me to throw the eggs into the pews and so people could catch them. Um, the problem with that is, first, I'm not a good baseball player. And secondly, I would not be responsible for hitting people in the head. 
So I felt it would be better if we just handed them out at the door. So when you came in this morning, you're, you're, this morning, I'm pretty sure you didn't expect that someone would be giving you eggs. Well, thank you for taking those eggs at the back when you came in. And, and thank you for the rest of you responding in joy. Oh, sorry, I'm reading too far ahead. Uh, well, thank you for taking the eggs. And now I would like you to open the eggs because there's a surprise in them. Inside the eggs, there should be, hopefully, jokes. <laughs> or the joke is on me. And uh, so if, if I would like, you know, if you feel encouraged or strong enough, you want to read the joke that's in your, your egg, we would love to hear it. I, I think we have a young lad in the back that's going to read. No, I couldn't. Blue and oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. I want you to know I'm not responsible for writing these jokes. <laughs> okay, I just want you to know that. Anybody else? Why do fish live in salt water? Why do fish live in salt water? Oh, because Pepper makes him sneeze. Okay. <laughs> what, do you, sorry, what do you call a pig who knows karate? What do you call a pig who knows karate? I don't know. A pork chop. Oh. <laughs> um, what did the stamp say to the envelope? What did the stamp say to the envelope? Stay with the envelope. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, yes? Why did the banana go to the doctor? Why did the banana go to the doctor? He wasn't feeling well. He wasn't? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have the urge to read one? Yes. What vehicle does Minnie Mouse drive? What vehicle does Minnie Mouse drive? I don't know. A minivan. A, a minivan. <laughs> Where do fish keep their money? In a riverbank. <laughs> In a riverbank. <laughs> Joyce? What do you get when you cross a turtle with a porcupine? What do you get, get when you cross a turtle with a porcupine? I don't know. A slow poke. <laughs> a slow poke. <laughs> Jim, I know you're dying to read your joke. Oh dear. All right. Where do mice park their boats? Where do mice park their boats? At the Hickory Dickory Dock. Uh, uh, <laughs> at the Hickory Dickory Dock. Okay. You know, I want to thank everybody who read their joy, their jokes, uh, um, and I really want to thank the people who laughed at them because some were pretty corny. Sometimes, sometimes God throws surprises our way. Sometimes there are great surprises, like a new baby brother. Sometimes there are not so great surprises, like a new baby brother. It all has to do with how we respond. And I think if we can try to find the positive side and the good part of God's surprises and share them with those we know and love and each other every day. Each event will make the world a happier place. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is Psalm 150 from the message. Hallelujah, praise God in his holy house of worship. Praise him under the open skies. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his magnificent greatness. Praise with a blast of trumpets. Praise by strumming soft strings. Praise him with castanets and dance. Praise him with banjo and flute. Praise him with cymbals and a big bass drum. Praise him with fiddles and mandolin. 
Every living, breathing creature, praise God. Hallelujah. The second reading, also from the message, is John 20, verses 19 to 31. Later that day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were awestruck. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We saw the Master. But he said, Unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my fingers in the nail holes, and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger, finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My master, my God. Jesus said, So you believe because you have seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. These words are offered as wisdom for our journey. May we walk together in their truth. Our next hymn is from More Voices. Never ending joy. start with a prayer. Lord of the universe, may all that gives us laughter and joy be a delight to you, O God who makes all things good. Amen. <clears throat> I can't tell you how honored I am to do the reflection today. I've always wanted to have a moment as a stand-up comic, <laughs> but I, I have no capacity whatsoever to tell a joke. 
I always get the punchline wrong. And if there's anything even the slightest off color about it, then I blush. In either case, a terrible silence always follows my attempt at humor. So I am never entrusted with anything remotely funny because the odds are it will be a disaster. And yet here I am. It's a tribute to your kindness. And something I will describe to my grandchildren. See, I will say, some people think I am able to be funny. And my grandchildren will roll about laughing at the very idea. <laughs> I do have a story to begin with. <clears throat> and it's true, it's not a joke. Really. So I will do my best to tell it the way it was. One time, Lauren Mead, who was a consultant for the Alban Institute, was catching a plane to San Francisco. The Alban Institute specializes in expert advice for churches. In fact, if you've ever had any reason to be in a minister's study over the last several decades, you probably would have seen one of Mead's books on a shelf. Lorne was standing in line, waiting his turn with the gate agent, when he noticed that the man in front of him was extremely belligerent. He wanted this seat, <clears throat> and he wanted this meal, and he wanted special treatment for his baggage, and he was demanding all this at the top of his lungs. The agent was very calm. She smiled sweetly as she dealt at length with everything he wanted and tenderly wished him an excellent flight as he strode away without saying thank you. When Lorne got to the counter, he said, that was amazing. I have to tell you, I'm a specialist in conflict management and you handled that very difficult person without ever losing your temper. How did you do that? And she said, Thank you very much, sir. It really is quite simple. That passenger is on his way to San Francisco, just as he was ticketed. But of course, his baggage is on the way to London, England. <laughs> of course, it's not a joke, it's a true story. So I could manage to tell it, <clears throat> but thank you for laughing. I think it is also an example of wit which is a particular subspecies of humor of which I am very fond. That's because although I am not myself a witty person, I know some people who are. They are the ones who can, with one quip, take a up end a conversation and reframe it so that everything is cast in a new light. According to my dictionary, these naturally witty people have the ability to, quote, perceive incongruous relationships and express them in a surprising manner. Surprise is certainly part of it. I'm sure that Lauren Mead had a moment of shocked delight when the, this very gracious gate agent faced with a bully, an incongruous relationship if there ever was one, suddenly reframed the situation. Lorne had spent much of his working life conscientiously trying to manage conflicted situations to make everyone a winner. It must have been a moment of some kind of glee to see just once the villain go down to defeat. I also asked for a definition of wit from our eldest child who attended Chippewa High School here in North Bay. It was an excellent experience, doubtless because of the principal at the time, Garth Goodhue. In the trophy case at this high school, proudly displayed among the many awards for football and basketball, was the coveted WIT Award. Our son actually won it more than once. We were very proud. And David was suitably self-deprecating the year he and another student tied for that same single wit award. Today, he said happily as he arrived home, I was recognized as a half-wit. <laughs> <laughs> I asked David this week, many, many years later, for his wit definition, and he offered this. 
a spontaneous, ironic recharacterization of a situation. And that's where the scripture text that Rod read for us today comes in, the one from John's Gospel. It's three days after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, sorry, three days after the crucifixion. The disciples have managed to gather together, or maybe huddle together is the right word. They are living in so much fear of the authorities that they have locked all the doors. The situation is awful. Their leader is dead, and they are at risk of death. And then, in an instant, everything is upended. Suddenly, Jesus is there with them. Death has been defeated. They are awestruck instead of terrified, full of joy instead of despair. In the middle of extreme violence, the one they love above all others is saying, peace, peace be with you. This is a moment, not of humor exactly, but possibly of wit. Death and life, peace and violence. These are disparate, incongruous, opposite states of being. And they are suddenly transformed and reframed as the encounter between a, a quiet gate agent and an outrageously entitled passenger. Furthermore, in the scripture story, we mustn't forget the absent Thomas, the straight man in this very unlikely divine comedy routine. He hears the story from the other disciples and concludes that they are joking. I won't believe it, he says. In other words, you've got to be kidding. But they are not kidding. And over and over in these days after the resurrection, we see this instant willingness to believe, to have hope, to exist on the sheer foolishness of faith. It always ends up in joy. Whether we are dejected on the road to Emmaus or wearily, sadly sitting by the lake shore, the risen Christ appears and changes everything in the blink of an eye. The story of our risen Lord is really very, very witty. <laughs> it's just that kind of warning. <laughs> this is... <laughs> so, that's the case, I think, still today. Whenever we are turning two opposites around, everything depends on our capacity to seize the moment. I'll tell you another story about a quick-thinking gate agent, not the same one. In fact, this one, this story may just be a, one of those airport legends. This time, though, as before, we have an agent and a long lineup of tired passengers. One passenger charges to the front, right at the front of the line, and shouts his desire to be served first. You'll have to get in line, sir, the agent says politely. Get in line, he says, highly offended. I don't stand in line. Do you know who I am? The agent immediately picks up the mic for the public address system. Attention, please. Attention, please, she says. We have a passenger here who has no idea who he is. <laughs> if you are traveling with him, could you please come to gate 122 right away and offer him some assistance? <laughs> but we need to go back to Thomas. Doubting Thomas, who simply could not believe in the possibility of a sudden, surprising upending of a terrible story. In this time in our history, we might be forgiven if we, like him, are somewhat disbelieving 
about the possibility of life over death. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like this, sir. <laughs> Where is that gate agent? <laughs> So, right now, it is hard to believe that things can be funny. If you look at what's happening in the world, innocent Ukrainians are dying under Russian guns, and dissident Russians are tortured for protesting it. Innocent Africans are dying from the effects of a change in the climate that they, of all the people on the planet, did very little to create. But we can try. We can act as if we do believe. It's what Jesus said to Thomas. Don't be on believing. Believe. We can act for justice whenever we possibly can in the firm belief that the gentle people will prevail, that the bullies will be laughed at, and that those powerful opposites, entitlement versus kindness, will be flipped and reframed so that life, not death, becomes the victor. When we believe that trying to heal any part of our hurting world is not wasted effort, when we believe that trying to heal any part of our hurting world is not wasted effort, then we can fully and completely rejoice in whatever surprises us with joy. The wedding of a friend, a text from a grandchild, an invitation to supper, that very first robin hopping across the lawn in springtime. Believe. That's what our sacred scriptures tell us. I'm going to close by reading part of a piece I wrote well over a decade ago. At that time, my editor had called me and suggested that for Easter, I could write a piece called, If I Had One Day Left to Live. So I'm going to read this, and you'll see the dated references to people and their ages, I am sure. But I hope that it still spontaneously recharacterizes death and life in the surprising way we have been talking about. I hope that it might even be called witty. Dying is something an elder thinks about. Suppose the angel was meant to come for me tonight at midnight. Raphael, I hope, the gentle guardian of those on pilgrimage towards God. Not to complain, I have been granted 68 years of days already and in good health. But how would I spend this day? If I had one day left to live, what I would do would depend upon the season. Yes, very much on the time of year. My father, for instance, died in November. He dug the parsnips, put away his shovel, and closed the garden shed for winter. He took the train south to his grandson's birthday, came home and died. I could do that. If autumn held my last day, I would do the same, sighing with satisfaction at our readiness for spring. But perhaps it would be winter then I would go down to the lake a few short blocks away. Baba would accompany me, pulling Elijah, our little grandson, in the sled. I would ruminate in silent pleasure on 45 years with Baba, formerly known as Jim. We would slide down the bank to the beach over and over and walk out on the ice afterwards, showing Elijah how to walk on water. For lunch, we would have lentil soup and bread and hummus, which Eli pronounces properly as hummus, like his friends in Jerusalem, where he lives. 
In winter, I make soup and bread. The oven warms the kitchen, and the soup is easily cooled by putting it out the back door. I would put this advice in notes to my family, along with assurance that I love them, but they know all that already. Of course, it might be summer. If that were so, I would weed and deadhead and dig some those dwarf yellow iris for my neighbor who admires them. I would persuade Baba to mow the lawn, the small lawn that I have refrained from turning into perennial beds. He will appreciate it when they gather for the post-funeral party. I will put that in my notes. Party, party, party. She died content. Rejoice. But then again, it might be spring. Robins would sing all day. At midnight, the angel, Raphael, would come sailing between worlds and worlds with steady wing, as the poet Milton says. Raphael would be here to carry me to God. We would talk. But God is here already, I would say, pointing out the songbirds silent in the night. And then I would invoke the resurrection and refuse to go. Thank you again for allowing me to reflect on these matters on Holy Humor Sunday. And in the name of the one who commands us to believe in life, not death, may everyone here today rejoice in the robins singing this springtime, as always. Amen.
Well, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get really hungry. Uh, <laughs> knock, knock. Andy. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And the, one of the things God asks as he talks with us is to share our blessings so that all may be blessed. Let us join together in our song of uh, uh, gathering our offering. What can I do? What can I do? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I sing? I'll sing with joy. I'll say a prayer. I'll bring my love. I'll do my share. What can I do? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I sing? I'll sing with joy. I'll bring my love. I'll do my share. Loving, caring, blessing God, take these, our gifts, joyfully given from your bounty, and make them yours to work great good in your beautiful world. Amen. Let us pray. God of love and laughter, we thank you that we are so wonderfully created to love and be loved. We thank you for laughter with families and those we love as family. We are thankful for the laughter of children and when we get together with friends. All this creates a melody of love in our lives, a song, a song that begins with you. Remind us to laugh out loud, for doing so will heal some of the wounds within us. Not all, but some. God, we pray for those who cannot find their laughter today, for those who are grieving or suffering illness of body, mind, or spirit, for those who are lonely and in need of someone to share their time and friendship. We pray for Carolyn Wright, whose mother Marjorie Gardner passed away last Friday. We pray for those who are not with us today because of things we have done or failed to do. May they know they are missed. Today, we pray for those who weigh upon our hearts, aloud or in silence. May these and the troubles of all your people be comforted by your holy presence. May we find the laughter within us that sets our spirits free and may we take your love into every part of our lives. We pray for those in the Ukraine and other places where war and violence is daily and love is clouded by hate. These and all the prayers of our hearts we offer to you, loving God. You are with us in times of crying and in laughter. Amen. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. This coming week is National uh, Volunteer Week, and one of the tasks our wonderful Reed Milne does is change the light bulbs when they blow. And that put him in the middle of this riddle. So bear with me. How many TV evangelists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one. But the bulb must repent of its darkness and be willing to be changed. <laughs> 
How many Pentecostals does it take to change a light bulb? 10. One to change the light bulb, and nine to pray against the darkness. How many Roman Catholics does it take to change a light bulb? None. They use candles. <laughs> How many United Church folks does it take to change a light bulb? Underdetermined whether your light is bright or dim or completely out, you are loved. You can be a light bulb, a turnip bulb, or a tulip bulb. Bring the bulb of your choice to our next property meeting along with a potluck dish to share. <laughs> Seriously, if you feel you could change light bulbs, or fold bulletins, or greet folks at the door on Sunday morning, or make phone calls to folks who can't come to church, or contribute your time in a way to assist in running St. Andrews. Please, please contact Lillian, or the church office, or anyone on council, or on the worship team. Okay, and now we have voices, we're gonna sing Voices United 884, You Shall Go Out With Joy. are sending forth. May our hearts be opened, our spirits lifted, our lips inspired, our hands gentled, and our joy magnified, so that our feet shall dance us out into this good week, carrying God's love and ours to a waiting world. Amen. Knock, knock. Hope. Hope to see you all next week. <laughs>